Alrighty guys, welcome to my shop. I am a handmade custom knife maker working in Texas. It is currently 95 degrees in my shop at 6 p.m. in the evening, so you can see why I am making this video. Today I will be installing a split system here that I found on Amazon from a company called Della. It is a one ton unit or 12,000 BTUs, and uh, we're gonna be putting this thing in. So stay tuned to the video and I hope you all enjoy. Step one of this process is going to be the wiring. I want to note here that I am not an electrician and any project you decide to take on in your own shop is at your own risk. Electricity will kill you. I decided to use MC armored cable to connect to my main breaker box. I did so since this negated the need for me to try to fit conduit connections behind my drywall. This cable is American wire gauge number 12 cable and I wired it to a 20 amp dedicated breaker. The mini split I ordered was the largest 110 version I was able to find online at 12,000 BTUs. I went with the 110 unit since I basically ran out of spots in my breaker box. This unit advertised around 700 square feet of cooling, but units similar to it advertised 550. My shop and gym total around 600 square feet, so this unit will be right at its capacity. My garage doors are insulated along with the walls and ceiling, so I think it'll be okay. I used 3 quarter of an inch conduit and LB conduit bodies to get my circuit out of the garage. It took me a while to find the appropriate hole height so I covered my mistakes in the drywall with a piece of plywood. While it's a little hard to see here, I made sure to use PVC adhesive to seal my connections. I didn't show it but I actually went back with caulk to make sure that moisture and bugs could not get through any cracks. My conduit is running to a 60 amp quick disconnect box. This box provides a really nice clean way to terminate the run of conduit and will also serve as a way to shut off power to the unit while outside. When it comes to mounting the inside unit, I start off by marking off where I want my large hole to be. Then I used a small drill bit to penetrate through the cardboard and into the center of this hole location in my wall. This allowed me to locate the first mounting hole of the bracket accurately on the wall. I then mounted the bracket with one screw holding it, leveled the bracket, and marked the remaining hole locations. The reason I did it this way was because I figured I could get a physical bracket more square than a piece of cardboard. The manual recommended a hole around 2 and 3 quarters of an inch, but I read a few reviews online that recommended going larger. I'm going to be drilling a 3 and a half inch hole since this will fit a standard piece of large conduit perfectly. To transfer this hole onto the outer wall, I used a long skinny drill bit that I normally use for drilling tang holes and handles for hand forged knives. Make sure to angle this hole a few degrees downward to aid in condensate drainage. I pushed a 3.5 inch conduit through the two holes until it was flush on the inside of my shop, then marked where I needed to cut it on the outside section. I didn't want this piece of conduit moving around easily, and I had some of this two part epoxy left over from an old project, so I decided to use it. With a hammer and punch, I'm sure I could drive this piece out after being epoxied, but for this application, the hold is perfect. Before mounting the wall unit, we have to connect the wires that will be run between the wall unit and the outside condenser. As you can see here, there is a nice wiring diagram on the front panel, and the wires are actually labeled, so this is a pretty easy task. The yellow wire goes to location number one, the white wire to location number two, the black wire to location number three, and the green to ground. With the inside of the unit wired, I carefully bent the refrigerant lines so that they are perpendicular with the assembly. I then used the supplied HVAC wrap to wrap the two coolant lines, the electrical cable, and the drain pipe. You want to make sure that the drain is oriented at the bottom of this wrap so that it gravity drains easily. It's then time to transfer all of these lines through the 3.5 inch conduit and hang the unit onto the bracket. This wall unit is pretty darn light and mounting it on the wall was easier than I thought it would be. I then carefully bent the lines coming out of the shop downward. You want this bend to be as curved as possible so as not to kink any of the copper refrigerant lines. I packed the hole with putty that came with the split system, however, for good measure I went back off camera with some spray foam to make sure that this section was sealed up. I decided to mount the outdoor unit onto the side of the building to keep it off the ground. This universal bracket ended up working out, but I could tell that it was designed for larger machines since Adela's mounting feet barely fit. On the mounting bar, I drilled an additional hole in line with my studs, which were 16 inches on center. I tested the bracket in the most scientific way possible, 
by seeing if it would support my weight of 190 pounds, which it did. The bracket came with little rubber feet that I used, however I found that the rubber feet that came with the split system were more robust. I later used the denser rubber to level the unit a little bit better. I like the look of the bracket holding the unit off the ground and I feel like it will be easier to keep clean and avoid any impacts when cutting grass. That being said, I think a concrete slab would likely do a better job with vibration, so keep that trade off in mind. To connect the refrigerant lines you're going to need a torque wrench and a set of metric crow's feet. I'll put links to these items along with all the items I used in the description below. Depending on the browser that you're using, you may need to click show more to see these links. The refrigerant lines have a pre-charge of gas that will be released when you remove the caps. I used Nylog Blue as the sealant for every one of these connections and torqued them down based on the specifications from the manual. For the larger 3 8 of an inch line, you're going to need around 30 newton meters, and for the quarter inch line, around 21 newton meters. While this process is pretty painless, make sure to take your time to get the connection straight before torquing. The copper flare is what is making the seal with the brass fitting, so you want to make sure to maximize your contact area by having the assembly in a straight and even orientation. After I got these two connections finished, I wrapped the run with more HVAC wrap that came with the system. This just keeps everything a little more orderly in my line cover, and I'm guessing it also adds a small layer of insulating capacity. These lines that came with Adela are pre-flared, so in an effort to not cut and flare the lines, I coiled up the excess behind the unit before attaching them to the machine. You'll see later that I ended up going back and modifying these lines for a neater install. The process is the same here with adding the Nylog Blue, straightening up the flare with the fittings, and torquing to the recommended torque settings. Next we will be hooking up the electrical. I had a set of these black connectors from a previous project where I built a heat treating oven and one of them was the perfect size for connecting the cables that are running from the inside unit to the condenser. You want a watertight connection here with whatever connector you decide to use. Like the inside unit, the outside unit is very easy to wire up. The cables are labeled along with the ports on the panel. The green ground wire goes to the green ground screw on the left side of the panel. The yellow wire goes to port number one, the white wire to port number two, and the black wire to port number three. On the power side, I hit the easy button and bought a 6 foot 10 American wire gauge whip that was pre-made. I verified that the 20 amp breaker was turned off and then wired up my quick disconnect box. Note that the red wire on the whip will be used as a neutral. I didn't show it here, but I used PVC adhesive on the flexible conduit and fittings to ensure a watertight fit. Over at the unit, I fed the wires in from the whip, cut them to a shorter length, stripped them, and then added some connectors to the ends. This side of the panel is super simple. You attach your green wire to the green ground screw on the right side of the panel, your red or white wire to the neutral, and the black wire to the load. After that, you can put the panel cover on and you're done with the electrical. I made sure to insert the quick connect crossbar in the off orientation while I continue on with the install for an added level of safety. Originally, I was going to call an HVAC technician to vacuum my lines, however, after getting some quotes, I figured it would be cheaper to just buy the equipment and do it myself. This will also save me some money in the future if I decided to install another one of these units somewhere else down the road, since I only need to buy the tools once. While we're talking about cost, I'll put up a quick breakdown of the project cost here, as well as at the end of the video. All in all, I feel like this is a pretty good deal for having a cooler shop to work in, and a bunch of new tools added to the arsenal. Pulling a vacuum on these lines is pretty straightforward. You connect the center yellow line to your vacuum pump and the blue low pressure line to your service port on the refrigerant lines. You won't be using the red side of the manifold, so I kept that valve shut. You then turn on the vacuum pump and open the blue valve on the manifold to start pulling a vacuum on the system. It seems like the standard to pull it down to at least negative 30 PSI for around 20 to 30 minutes. Depending on the length of your line set, I'd imagine it wouldn't hurt to run this pump for a longer period of time. To shut off your pump, first shut your blue valve on the manifold to trap the vacuum in your lines, then turn off the pump. At this point, you need to wait around 30 minutes to an hour or more to verify that your system is holding the vacuum without leaks. 13 minutes in and I've lost 15 pounds, so I am not holding a vacuum. Time to investigate. I started off looking for my leak by cutting away some of the insulation on the quarter inch copper. I thought I could have kinked it at this spot, but it was all good. I then found out that my first issue was actually the adapter from my valve manifold to the service port. The one I was using came with my pump, 
and seemed to be poorly constructed, so I used a better adapter that I had ordered separately. I ran through the process of vacuuming the lines again and found that I was still getting a leak in the system. By spraying a little Windex on my connections, I found that I had a leak on the 3 8 of an inch copper line right at the connection to the condensing unit. Since this broadened the scope of this project and added a new set of flaring tools to my toolbox, I decided to cut away the excess copper lines and clean up the visual appearance of my install. I've never made flare connections on copper before, so this was a good opportunity to learn a new set of skills as well. I later took this excess copper and taped off the ends for storage. I figured it could be useful in the future for other projects. Once I got the new flares made, I applied some Nylog blue to the faces and reattached the lines to the condensing unit with the appropriate torque settings. Then once again, I ran through the vacuuming procedure. All right, so we have the lines modified in length so it's much cleaner on our machine. I vacuum tested the lines and I have a good hold. It's holding very well. It's held for over an hour now uh, at negative 30. But one thing I will say is that I noticed a crack on one of my flare fittings and this flare fitting actually came with the mini split. I went to Home Depot and got me a new one. So I'm gonna take it all apart again, put on this new flare fitting, and then hopefully everything pressure tests again. So with this in mind, I'd recommend looking over all of your flare fittings before releasing the refrigerant into the system. Once you have a refrigerant in the system, the process of fixing these issues is more complicated. Happily, these are pretty common fittings, so you can replace them locally if you get duds like I did. All right, so we have held the vacuum now for over an hour of negative 30 PSI. So it's time to open the refrigerant lines. Before I do that, I'm gonna use this little electronic leak detector to make sure I get a zero reading around the fittings so that once I open the lines, I can then test again to see if I'm getting any leaks around the fittings. This leak detector came with the pump, so I figured I'd use it. However, I really don't think using this leak detector is necessary. Per the instructions in the manual, I only released a small amount of refrigerant into the system with a four second opening of the valve. This allowed me to check for leaks before flooding the entire system. With everything looking good, I opened each of the Allen head release valves to their wide open position, then quickly removed my low pressure line from my valve manifold. You'll get a little refrigerant come out here, so try to take it off as fast as possible. It may make sense to wear a set of gloves as well. With the assembly completed, you can now reinstall your plastic line cover to the side of the unit, then flip the crossbar on your safety cutoff box into the on position. All that's left to do is to turn this bad boy on. All right, so at 12.50, it is about 92 degrees, or about 93 really in the shop. So we'll see how it does over the course of the next hour. So this mini split has been running for a few hours now. It is 4.30 in the afternoon. The ambient temperature outside is 91 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm getting 81 degrees right at the entrance of my shop, which is in the gym area. I'm using this thermometer that's used for cooking because it's more responsive than the clock thermometer that I was using earlier. In the middle of the room where the mini split is mounted, I'm getting a little slightly lower degrees here. Let's see, I'm at like 79, 78 degrees on this thing. As I move around this side of the shop, uh, it seems like it's staying pretty much where it was. I'm at about 78.8 right here. So this is very livable conditions for my workshop, way better than it has been. And I'm looking forward to using this thing this summer. It's also got a heat pump on it, so I'll be using it in the winter time too because I bet it gets pretty cold out here. So I hope you all enjoyed that one. If you did, please hit the like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel. I know it's a newer channel with not a lot of content on it yet, but I plan on posting more DIY type videos like this one. So if you wanna see those in your feed, make sure you also hit the bell notification. So with that, this is Redbeard Engineered, signing off.